All right, Tim, we are back making our way down the checklist here. We've figured out when we're going to train. We figured out our exercises. We've done our pre-screening. Now we're getting into the variables. So when we look at variables, what are the variables that we should be considering? Well, top of the list is a rep. I think that's the easiest to kind of build off of. Mm -hmm. Think about a rep, it's that eccentric, pause in the contracted position, concentric, pause in the relaxed position. And that denotes that tempo. Uh, so think about one complete rep is going through the full eccentric, isometric, concentric, isometric phase. And then that can kind of further extrapolate out into tempo. So that sequence is intentional. Eccentric, that's the first number we'll see in tempo. And we look at the pausing, the contracted position. That's the second number. Third number being concentric. And the fourth number is that pause in the relaxed position or the position where we don't have to exert any tension. So tempo is the next variable to kind of think about when we're thinking about rep. And they're synonymous with repetitions. You know, the, the time component to me is, I think is mission critical because when we look at all prescription of exercise and variables, it gets into this, what is the actual thing that we're trying to develop and how can we quality control that? And when we look at time and retention, a repetition is not a repetition if it takes a really long time, relatively speaking to a repetition, it takes a really short period of time because a 10 second set versus a 60 second set doing the same amount of reps trains drastically different things. And having a component to control that time or tension becomes mission critical. Now, in the grand scheme of things, having some sort of effect of progressive overload and thinking about diminishing returns and all sorts of other principles of training as a primary focal point before we start thinking about time or attention, always going to be the case. But the other aspect of it is when we're talking about the qualities we're trying to develop, the controlling that time that we're spending during each rep is mission critical, but it leads into the next part of the intensity, right? So if we look at repetitions and intensity have this inverse symbiotic relationship and that they're, they're never going to be disjointed, right? They're always going to talk about either rep max or rep in reserve or a relative intensity that we're going to connect with some sort of repetition, right? So if I'm going to do four to six reps, we think a little bit higher percentage, relatively speaking, of my rep max, which would be about, you know, 85%, depending if we work on this 2.5% per rep or 5% per rep, whatever you're looking at. But that connectedness of that RM to that repetition, I think has a big missing gap when we think about the time and attention piece. And as we start to break down like a 10 RM, which let's just say from a two and a half percent RM is that 77 to 80% rep or, rel or intensity for that rep max jar, that could be wildly different if that tempo takes 60 to 70 seconds. And now we're looking into shaving off an extra two and a half percent per rep. Now we're getting to this 5% per rep. And all of a sudden we look at that rep max chart and then intensity and that symbiotic relationship that happens with the repetitions becomes obsolete. And you start scratching your head as to why that rep max chart doesn't really hold up when we start to utilize that within training, like trying to govern an intensity based off the repetition. And then you'll hear pundits are saying, Periodization is dead, that there's no such thing as a rep max or a relative intensity or anything of that nature. Yeah, if there's no controlling of the time variant. And that to me is one of the things that I think is a, a missed opportunity by a lot of strength and conditioning coaches is this notion that time doesn't matter per rep. And then it leads to a slippery slope of saying the intensity doesn't matter. And all that matters is just reps and just going to essentially as close as we can to volitional failure. Uh, and maintaining some sort of quality or technique. But when we start to break down this like periodization or programming, it's all really just a hypothesis leading into some sort of experiment. And when we think about, all right, well, what are the quality controls I have within that experiment? And I'm going to utilize reps and intensity with no idea of the, the actual duration of time that repetition took then all of a sudden we start to miss out on the, the critical nature of what that time to rest or that time to intensity ratio really breaks down to. And for context, time is a huge variable in things like bioenergetics or looking at energy system development. 
Mm -hmm. And doing a squat versus a cyclical activity like a bike is, is, is really no different. We're looking at the quality control. And in one area, we look at energy system research and looking at bioenergetics, the time variant is more important than we're not talking about how many revolutions we're doing on a bike, right? Or how many steps we take when we're running 400 meters. We think about it from the time it takes to complete it. So why wouldn't we attribute that to the same thing we're looking at from a repetition within a set? And if that set takes 70 seconds, that's a massive difference than a set that takes 30 seconds. And we could easily knock out 10 reps in 20 seconds or less. And that's a quality that is more representative of increasing strength. And we look at that from a phosphagen or ATP PCR system. That's very similar to that nature of short, intense burst stuff versus a set that takes 60 to 70 seconds just to grind it out, slow controlled, just, just wailing through certain repetition. And that, that's a whole different energy system. That's glycolytic. That's like, that might even be glorified oxidative. Mm -hmm. And then we start to think about, okay, well, like, how does that equate for intensity? Like, oh, well, yeah, 10 RM doesn't really matter because I've seen such discrepancy from the percentage intensity that someone may use for a 10 rep max from one person to the next. So therefore it's obsolete. So therefore periodization becomes less necessary. No, you're just not accounting for all the variables that you should be. So keeping track of that, I know there's a tangent, but we've got repetition, the timer detention per repetition. Then we look at the intensity, which should have some sort of relationship with the repetition of time or intensity. Traditionally, there is an inverse relationship. So if I look at the intensity being high, repetitions being low or time and attention being low. If I look at the opposite end of the spectrum, repetition being high or time and attention being long, then we look at the intensity being lower. And that inverse relationship between the two is probably the most important thing you need to get across to your clients and athletes right off the bat. Because it, it leads into this, we assume they understand that. We assume that they think that is intuitive, but they don't. Mm -hmm. And you'll start seeing stuff like, instead of doing three sets of 10, I just did one set of 30. I didn't know the difference. You'll start seeing stuff. I'll use the same weight as I use for a set of 10 when I transition to a set of five. Like I didn't realize there was a, a difference. I didn't realize we can just, we need to use a different weight. And that's a clear loss of connection to the underlying foundation of how variables should interact with an exercise and within a program. And that thought process of the reason why we did a set of five versus a set of 10 versus a set of 20 is because I'm trying to develop something. The final variable is the rest. And again, that like intersection of intensity and rest. So longer intensity, higher rest right? They have now a linear relationship as opposed to an inverse relationship. So if I think about a shorter duration, time and retention with high intensity, that's going to have a longer rest period because we're looking at more central nervous system type inputs and the CNS or the, the nervous system that governs all these things like impulses, synchronization, rate coding, motor unit, pooling, coupling, contraction rates trying to recruit higher threshold motor units and muscle fibers is going to tax the nervous system in a more robust way. We're just sending more violent action potentials. So it dampens the CNS ability, which creates a longer rest period. Versus in the other end, we are utilizing more muscular output, so more local, and we're going longer durations. That leads into a lower intensity, and that might mean into a, relatively speaking, shorter rest period. And for context, the user experience doesn't feel like that rest period is long enough for the shorter duration, for the longer duration stuff. And it feels like it's too long for the shorter duration stuff, which tells us it's a very clear, clear need to rationalize this and explain this with our clients and athletes, because the intuitive thing would be, I'm not tired. I don't feel a lot of muscular, sore, muscular fatigue. So I should be able to go faster or go with less rest. And the other end of it is if I feel completely gassed and I don't have a lot of CNS fatigue, which is not really like something that you actually feel or feel intuitive, people feel the less need to recover or the less need to rest. And it gets out in front of the, we have to be very clear on the expectations where we do a certain time and retention, a certain rep scheme, certain intensity with the rest that is connected with it. But those are going to be the, the four variables. We look at repetitions, time and retention, intensity. And then we look at rest and then I should throw on the fifth one just because it's necessary is sets or total number of sets we're going to do. 
And when we think about the inter inter exercise rest and going in between A1 to A2, or we go into a A1 between A1s, right? We're not gonna do an A2. That set and that rest has another linear relationship. So more sets, longer rest. And that traditionally ties into lower repetition and higher intensity. If we're gonna do less sets, we typically need less rest. And then we can see that tying into doing, we can doing more reps and, and a hopefully longer time, time of retention. And all that stuff has a slight connection. And, you know, Charles Poliquin is, is kind of the guy for a lot of this. And I mean, credit with credit's due, we should definitely give some sort of technology to it and talking about this, like rules or principles of program design and this idea of sets and reps have an inverse relationship, intensity and repetitions have an inverse relationship. We look at intensity and rest has a linear relationship. We look at sets and, and, and rest has a linear relationship and we start to tie all this together and it's a quick little peruse of your workout to go, okay, how does this structure? Like, do I have a lot of sets and reps with a minimal rest? Okay. Well, maybe I need to start to organize this a little way, but the real big thing is I'm going to talk a lot about this today is this idea that it should have some sort of connection to a larger, more aggregate plan that is very clear to everyone. It, the, and like, I know what I'm getting at. Like, don't bury the lead with your training with having a lot of like, essentially stuff that's not connected or related to what you're doing. This would be a good time, I guess, then to just dive right into how do we marry those things up, marry the qualities up to the sets, reps, tempo, all the things we want to make sure we're getting what we want out of training. Yeah. So the pragmatist in me wants to always kind of build towards something, right? The, the break complex things into a very binary, you know, bullet point list organization. And it comes from a theory of like block periodization of, okay, can we understand the outcome? Reading that like a cyclical activity, like running a 400 meter or a 1600 meter has a certain bioenergetic and biomotor and even biomechanical list of things it needs, right? Like do I need from a biomechanic, front side, backside mechanics, arm action, leg action, et cetera. From a biomotor, do I need a certain amount of force velocity or work? And then from a bioenergetic, like, do I need a certain amount from the phosphogen system, the glyphalytic system, or the oxidative system? And you start to create an easy analysis of like, what is the primary biomotor, bioenergetic, and biomechanical fit necessary things for that person to be successful. And you organize your training to reach that outcome. And you look at it from a strengths and weakness perspective, or you look at it from a peaking perspective, what is going to be the organizational layer? We talked a lot about this so far of this, am I going towards or am I going away? And the, the nature of block periodization is to me, this, it should resonate with the pragmatist programmer. The one that looks at, if I just silo off a certain thing, I can further understand the actual impact short-term and long-term. And what you really think about in terms of, of a block periodization is creating this training residual from the individual quality you're trying to develop. And the residual should lead or bleed over into the next quality that we're trying to develop and give either a higher ceiling or a greater, greater platform to grow and evolve from. It should lead into a certain period away from what we're trying to be. And I'm trying to develop some sort of weakness into a strength, or I'm trying to develop a prerequisite to get to a peak. But all that being said is the qualities represent what we're trying to really do with our, our reps, our time and retention, our intensity, our rest and number of sets on any given day. And the qualities really break down into the, the big five of power, relative strength, functional hypertrophy, hypertrophy and muscular endurance as these things that are, they're not arbitrary and they're not this like very like, I guess, binary approach to looking at like, or we could just essentially look at this in isolation and has no connection to the outside world. What is doing is looking at it from, if I develop this in this period of time, should have some sort of concentric circle leading into a greater overall outcome or a higher peak. And that rep, that time and attention, that intensity, that rest, and those total number of sets will have a massive impact on that quality they're trying to develop. So if we're looking at power, it's got to be brief and intense. And I mean, power is this 30% window. When we look at that 
force velocity profiling. It's right in the middle. It's right. It's a little bit heavy. It's a little bit fast. It's kind of in that sweet spot. So if it's, we're looking at developing some sort of quality, it's got to be under 10 seconds. And with that being said, as we described, that 10 seconds has a, 10 seconds is a short duration. So intensity should therefore be high, relatively speaking, right? So if we're looking from a traditional compound multi-joint movement and that force velocity profile, it'd be 30%. It doesn't mean that we're only going to go 30%. That's not quote unquote, the intensity marker. It's that 30% now is my hundred percent. And I'm trying to be hundred percent of that 30%, if that makes sense. And I'm trying to focus on intent or rate of force development and having hundred percent peak force development in as rapid of a manner as possible. Can I move something with as much rapidity as possible? And do I need enough rest to govern that? Right. And that governs into the number of sets, the total rest we can do. And then a lot of times the exercise, and the reason why we talked about exercises first is because not all exercises are really good for developing power. You know, when I argue, unless we're putting some sort of accommodating resistance, the decelerative nature of doing a traditional compound movement, like a, like a hinge and a squat is really limited. Like we, like doing an RDL is not enough range of motion to develop power. Just not. And it's not going to create enough momentum, right? We go through this creating inertia coming out of the bottom or the amortization. And then we try to accelerate that bar, creating a momentum. And that momentum doesn't build because we have to eventually stop. It's too short. So why there might be a case of utilizing a flywheel or a med ball or even a barbell with compensatory acceleration, the old fashioned way with Olympic lifts, creating propulsion and not having to decelerate, that falls really nice and neatly into this power continuum. But it's got to be short, got to be intense, got to have enough rest, probably needs a lot more sets. Then we look at relative strength, which is about 20 seconds and under, right? And it kind of falls into this, can't be under probably five seconds because it's not going to be long enough. And then it probably can't go over 20 seconds because it becomes too glycolytic or energy consuming, All right, And that goes into, again, this, it's a low time under tension. So we're going to utilize a higher intensity. We're going to need a lot more rest and we're going to need a lot more sets. Right. Cause we're building volume through sets, not necessarily through the actual number of repetitions. And we need enough exposures at this intensity. That's probably above 85%. And this gets into that window of now absolute strength that if I have a greater reserve and I guess tangent, like anyone's ever read strength deficit and looks at it from the absolute versus, I guess, relative strength. Relative. To, to, yeah. That would be strength deficit, like, sure. If you want to call it that, I call it strength reserve. It doesn't matter. You know, just strength deficit is the difference between eccentric and concentric. And I don't care what Mel Sitch says, like, well, who's to say he actually correctly uh, translated Russian text, right? Like if you're listening to this Mel, I'm right here. I want proof that we can actually know, we actually know that you translated that text correctly. And Mom if Mel, Yuri, yeah, on the books. Yuri, yeah, if Yuri or Vladimir, or any other Russian name is out there can corroborate this by all means, send me a DM and then I'll, and I'll screenshot it and I'll blank out all the things that were essentially saying that I'm wrong and, and st double down and stick to what I think is true. Cause I have a whole book on topic and I'm the expert would exactly. That's what the experts do. You know, let me be the leader that you want me to be by being ignoring and dismissive to anything that yes. runs contrary to what I believe is true. So, but if we're looking at it from this like relative strength. Uh, focal point, you know, that absolute strength window, things that are more connected to having a higher absolute load make a lot more sense for relative strength. Now, I still typically utilize as like some sort of governor if there is a biomechanical limitation here, right? So can I front squat more than I back squat if someone has some sort of pre-existing issue like with, with biomechanics from some sort of orthopedic thing or asymmetry, et cetera, um, or just looking at split squat. Like I want to get really strong here. And I want to follow, focus less on the exercise that leads to highest absolute load. But if I can use exercises based off this bio biomechanical criteria that have a higher potential to load, like a barbell split squat over a dumbbell split squat or a front squat over a gobble squat, I'm going to lead to whatever that biomechanical thing with the, the appropriate governor into that. And again, it gets into higher intensity, less time and attention less overall reps. We're going to have more sets and longer rest in between. Then we'll move into functional hypertrophy. And this is like, we'll just do hypertrophy and functional hypertrophy together. This notion of functional hypertrophy is the more classic myofibril hypertrophy that we're trying to sell, develop the size of the muscle cell. 
versus hypertrophy is this cellular swelling, metabolic stress based hypertrophy that we're trying to increase the actual surrounding cellular fluid and hopefully having a downstream effect of an endocrine bump and increasing hypertrophy through other mechanisms. Both are critical. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, if we're going to look at a, a body mass dependent sport that needs increased body size, like a football offensive lineman or a shot putter, you know, if we're going to develop hypertrophy, having a conscious awareness of increasing size of the cell in general and utilizing mechanisms that are going to be more, more lipolysis oriented or burning more fat as fuel and increasing their capacity through doing these compound multi-joint movements or these traditional strength exercises for longer durations. So improving the quote unquote fitness while increasing their size makes a lot of sense. But on the other end, if I have a sprinter or a wide receiver or a person that body mass actually becomes a limiting factor because they're running a ton of mileage in practice or they got to be really good and change the direction at high speed, then yeah, maybe I need to be conscious of more of this functional hypertrophy to increase the size of the muscle cell, increasing the strength of that muscle cell. Both are going to have some sort of positive effect on increasing the connective tissue or the, the tendons and ligaments around that. I would argue that when we get into the, what's that could actually be a bigger targeting effect of doing myofibril versus hypertrophy, it's the time spent on eccentric versus concentric. And if we even isometric, that's going to have bigger changes from the actual connective tissue around that muscle cell. And that gets into this, why it's so important to really distribute time strategically towards each phase of that contraction. So if I'm just, just get the reps done, do five reps at 80% and, you know, shut your mouth and don't talk to me about anything else, like, and be an absolute strength reserve guy, like, you know, like everyone else is just in the world, like thinking about this, I want to have a positive effect on isometric to elicit something to change in the connective tissue around it. So I want to increase the tendon strength and, and elasticity and looking at series elastic component, as opposed to just increasing the size of the muscle cell without any conscious impact on trying to improve the quality of the tendons and ligaments around them. I mean, if I'm going to spend a, let's say I'm going to do a two, five X zero tempo on some sort of thing that's going to target specific tissues like the patella tendon or Achilles or even looking at the bicep tendon, something of that nature, then yeah, like having more of a case to do that, but it's all strategic on where am I going to fit within that quality and what is the, the intended outcome based off that quality. And the last one is muscular endurance and it's getting above 70 seconds. And I, I would say that just in the other end of the continuum power, that if we have a limited number of exercises we can use effectively for power, same thing for muscular endurance. It's does it pass the shit test? Like when I get past a certain number of reps, it's going to look bad. And there are just certain exercises that look better longer and being conscious of that. And sometimes it gets into an isolation. Sometimes it takes into account of the simplicity or the, the organic nature of that movement that feels like it, you can't do it wrong. Like I, you know, part of my French, but I call them don't fuck up exercises like that you can do with anybody as long as humanly possible. Like so easy, a, a, a NARP could do it kind of thing. Like that thing leads into this like very strategic programming that I think we can get the boat the best from that muscular endurance effect. And now we're getting the longer duration, 70 seconds, and that come in form of doing like 20 reps or 10 reps with a 7-0 actual tempo, right? Um, prime numbers are underrated with tempo or repetitions anyway. Highly underutilized. Yeah. No one uses prime numbers, man. Like, I mean, when's the last time a strength coach looked at Fibonacci sequence as a, where to pull your rep scheme from? Um, but the other note, like it's into this idea of looking at it from when I think about, when I think about this longer duration thing, like it opens you up so much when you have, I don't have to do sets of 20, right? And there's a nice thing about doing a set of 20 on muscular endurance. It's simple, intuitive. People immediately get this, okay, this is going to be a longer duration. I'm going to have to go lower intensity. It's going to be hard versus doing eight reps with a 12 OXO tempo doesn't feel as specifically muscular endurance. And yes, I fully grasp that that makes a big difference. And with certain audiences, you might want to do it. But remember, we're always going to be stronger eccentrically and isometrically than we are concentrically. So I'm spending majority of my time for longer duration things or maximally loaded things, eccentrically and isometrically, I'm going to have greater load and I'm going to be able to go longer safer. 
And when I'm thinking about strategy and I'm looking at compliance and I'm looking at the performance and trying to get to that quality outcome, you know, I'm going to be very, very conscious of that. So as you kind of roll into this and, and we dive deeper and deeper, it seems to me less so like exercise first, then variables, you kind of got to know what you're weaving into. It's not one, then the other, you kind of got to do it simultaneously to know what you're looking for and then start to bleed it into each other. Is that, does that make sense or is it my right track there? It absolutely does. So I would say from this two, two end approach, right? So on the one end, I know the quality I'm trying to work. On the other end, I know the exercises that I'm, I'm not going to be able to be successful with based off my biomechanical assessment. So I'll do that asymmetry, pain, restriction, range of motion. It consolidates down that list. And then I got to go with the remaining list of what connects best with that quality that I'm trying to develop. And I have to start making decisions off of, if I'm working this quality that could get really bad quickly if I don't account for it. How can I align the time under tension or the intensity or the work to rest to really get the best from those exercises that I have pretty much a limited skew of, of things I can pull from? Mm -hmm. Hey, I like to tell our students like, hey, I'm putting up bumpers in a bowling alley so you can hit the pins we're trying to hit. And that, you know, that's the quality we're looking for. Like, hey, we, we are, we're trying to get really strong in this block. So I want you to stay in this tempo, stay in this speed, and you're going to be more successful than if you weren't. Yeah. I mean, we, to be honest, like probably could get into a whole nother rabbit hole on, on velocity-based training and how right. that has an impact on, on your repetition, on the reps you use, the intensity you're the, using it, as a, that's the other metric. And to be frank, when we're looking at like the Polycon principles or even like Bill Starr, Stronger Shall Survive, like this, the reason why I did five by five is the sweet spot between strength and hypertrophy, mm -hmm. you know, like that. And and what he did too, which was a genius at the time, if you think about it, he essentially just put a governor and that was, that's where I get this governor idea from. It's this idea of this heavy modern life. But instead of thinking about like that, which my good friend, Augie, who worked under Bill would say, he's like, he never referred to them as heavy, modern or light. He always said they're heavy. He just had a lower ceiling, right there. He, everything was heavy. You just go yeah. as hard as you possibly can. Essentially, you just adjusted the governor and which weight you could use. But to, to note that when we're thinking about VBT now, you know, that bar speed is essentially a governor. Right. I'm working, I'm working absolute strength. So I'm going to be in this specific speed zone, I'm working strength speed or speed strength or velocity, you know, max velocity, like all these things have, have restrictions on what quality you're trying to do. So if I look at power, for instance, like, you know, try to do, try to do a, an absolute strength 0.3 to 0.5 meter per second with a bench press for four or five reps. Like it, it it's going to be slower. And mm -hmm. people all the time can go multiple reps below 0.25. And it, I mean, it grinds it out. Yep. But with that, like goes in, okay, well now I'm kind of like below this critical window. I want to at least know how long that set took, right? So if it's 0.3 to 0.5 meters per second, but every single rep is just 0.2 to 0.25, but it took 30 seconds, that, that changes some things, right? That changes yep. the potential of the outcome. It's just another thing to track and measure and be aware of. So we're not surprised by the end. So if I'm trying to develop this specific quality, because I think it's going to have this bleed over effect into the greater overall aggregate, and I'm completely blown away. Like, I had no idea that happened. You know, how did this come to be? I can look back at the input. Like Elijah Golrad said it so well, like it, input or throughput gets, gets output. If I don't really have a good control of what I'm putting into the system, I'm not going to be able to predict what comes out of that. And if I'm creating this program to get to this outcome and I have no idea what goes in and then what goes out, you're never going to have the consistency and outcome that you want. You know, it's it's all a bad science experiment. Yeah. Like if we're looking at bell curve distribution, it's going to fall like organically. Law of averages will say there'll be high and low responders and most people come through. The difference is if I'm looking at that bell curve of, hey, this, let's just say, for example, 40 inch vertical jump is like this gold standard and I have a bell curve distribution of maybe one person gets that. And then the low, the standard deviation in the opposite direction is like 10. I want to shift everyone over to the right. I want 10 people over 40 and I want the average to be 35 and mm. I want our, our low average to be 30 and I want our low score to be 25. That we're all going to fall into that bell curve, no matter what, it's going to be law of nature, right? Law of averages is true no matter what you do it. But the difference is. If I'm having high and moderate responders, I want more people in the high and I want the low to be a lot higher than our other people's low or a lot, of, maybe even our other people's high. Yeah. That's kind of the standard we're looking for. 
And I want to be very predictive with what I'm doing so I can see that more consistently. Yeah. All right. That's a good place to wrap it up. I think, Tim, this was been, I think this is a really good one. So thank you. Yes, sir.